But what happens on the inside of the gut wall is reflected on our skin. And so, yeah, vitamin D is, everybody should be taking vitamin D3. You know, so it, you really do look amazing. Uh, you know, the idea is for us, one of the most important things that we talk about is skin. And so we're going to get into some of the diets and supplements and things like that. But, you know, and, and we recently just interviewed Paul Saladino as well. So it's interesting looking at some of the the, the, the different takes on this. Um, I think there's some common thematics there, um, you know, with lectins and some of the, 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 the different phytochemicals. Um, but when we talk a little bit about healthy skin and kind of reversing wrinkles and things like that, first of all, uh, have you experienced de-aging? You know, how did you come across this? Maybe tell us a little bit of your story and then we can go into how, what you think can be uh, good for our skin. Sure. Um, actually, one of the things that continues to shock me, um, this actually this week, uh, a new patient said, I have heard about your hands, but I didn't believe it. And she's sitting across from me and she said, let me look at your hands. And <laughs> she said, what the heck? You know, it's, it's true. You know, I'm, I'll be 73 in a month. And she said, that, that those don't look like 73 year old hands. And I used to have pretty old looking hands. Um, I used to have a lot of quote age spots which uh, were on my hands. So I've got, I've got one left. You can't see it, uh, but I used to have a lot of them, and they all dissolved um, by changing my diet twenty five years ago. And I get to see it happen in in tons of patients when they change their diet. Their their age spots disappear or lighten or, you know, their liver spots or their sun spots. And they're actually, as you guys know, uh, advanced glycation end products, which really are the combination of the proteins in us and that we eat and the sugars in us uh, that we have or eat and heat that our body produces. And that combination uh, is called the Mallard reaction. So you take protein and sugar, it produces one of the strongest chemical bonds that's ever been found. And unfortunately, it happens to us 24 hours a day. It happens in our heart, it happens in our brain, but in a way, the good news is we can see it on our skin. And you can manipulate forming those chemical bonds by reducing certain proteins, reducing certain sugars, and uh, you can even reduce it by lowering your body temperature, but that's another story. So that's that's one of the easy things uh, to do that people just always are shocked. In fact, in the, in the plant paradox, I, I wrote about this couple from Oregon who are um, snowbirds in Palm Springs during the winter, and they dr drive a big RV down from Oregon to Palm Springs every fall. And apparently, as they tell the story, he's driving along. This was their first year after being my patients. And the wife says, you know, John, you know, look at your hands. And he grips the steering wheel and goes like this to look at his hands and nearly goes off the road. <laughs> and, <Fears> off. <laughs> and it was because he had had a lot of these sunspots and they literally had di disappeared. And it's, uh, it's a remarkable finding that people go, son of a gun, I've got control of this. This isn't just me getting old. In your books, you know, I know we talk about, um, you know, some of the harmful effects of plants, but in what particular diet would you choose that would help reverse some of those age spots? What do you think is one of the most powerful ingredients? Well, um, I just put my upcoming book uh, to bed this week, just finished it, and it's called Gut Check, and it'll be out uh, January of 2024. And the interesting thing about Gut Check that I've, I've written about before, but I really, um, in, in all deference to Paul Saladino, 
if you wanted to age rapidly, and if you wanted your skin to age rapidly, then you ought to follow a carnivore diet. Um, it is the guaranteed most damaging diet to the wall of your gut, to your blood vessels. And it has to do, I, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. I have nothing against steak, uh, except uh, it trying to kill me. Uh, so the there's a sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork called NU5GC. Um, we and fish and chicken have a different sugar molecule called NU5AC. Actually, they differ by only one molecule of oxygen. They're otherwise identical. They form this really cool lining of our blood vessels called the glycocalyx. They form the lining of our blood-brain barrier. They form the lining of our joints. And they partially form the myelin sheath. And these sugar molecules, if you eat a, a lot of beef, lamb, or pork, you develop antibodies to this abnormal sugar molecule. And we thought that maybe you attacked your own blood vessels because of this, but it gets worse than that. It turns out that these sugar molecules can actually be incorporated into the lining of our blood vessels, into our blood brain barrier, into our joints. And we then attack actively our blood vessels, our joints, our blood brain barrier. And this is now scarily documented if you want even worse news, cancer cells use new 5 gc to evade the immune system. And we don't manufacture new 5 gc And yet every cancer tumor has new 5 gc in it. So the bad news is that if, if you want cancer and if you want to attack your blood vessels and your brain and your joints, then have a grass-fed, grass-finished steak. And the worst part is liver actually has the highest amount of new 5GC of, of, of any substance. <laughs> it is very interesting. I think what the public doesn't realize. So, you know, one thing that we look at, obviously, between epidemiologic studies and interventional studies, and there are a lot of causal relationships and things like that. But what you guys are, what you are uh, specifically referring to is scientific interventional studies showing these results. And so um, I think it's important to keep this in mind for our listeners. So um, if those are the bad things, then, you know, and, and we're going to touch a, a, on collagen a little bit too, collagen supplementation, because it's all rave, rave. And, um, you know, I think there's maybe one study that partially showed some type of benefit we you know it's really hard to study some of these things I, you know the general public doesn't realize that but if we talk about some of the nutrients that you recommend i mean if if i said all right i'm gonna sit down for my skin alone which you know obviously is a reflection of what's happening on underneath right what food should i be focusing on well i think you bring up an interesting point about collagen um Collagen is, you know, 80% of, of us in a way. And I'm old enough to remember where uh, almost every day of everybody's lives, we were eating large amounts of gelatin, which is collagen, in the form of jello. And Dave Asprey and I joke about this, that inadvertently, we every day um, had bone broth uh, as a dessert. And the other thing we had multiple times a week was consomme, which was bone broth. And that was just a normal part of kind of everybody's diet. You had a bowl of consomme soup at a fancy restaurant. You'd start off with a, a bowl of consomme or jellied consomme. And it was just, it was just all gelatin. Now, we don't, none of us actually, hopefully, uh, eat jello anymore, but it was a great source of gelatin. And gelatin can be useful for 
But you're right. There are really poor studies that collagen, if you take it as a supplement, actually reconstitutes as collagen once you swallow it. And somehow people think that all of these various substances aren't broken down into their original amino acids and they're absorbed as these amino acids. And then there isn't a assembly form on the other side of your intestine saying, hey, you just ate collagen. You should put this back together as collagen. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work that way. We just have a bunch of amino acids. And if you want to reassemble them with vitamin C to make collagen, be my guess. But there's no imperative to do that. Plus, you don't need collagen to make collagen. You can get the individual amino acids. And I think the thing that many people don't realize is you really have to have vitamin C to complete the process. And most of us are wildly vitamin C deficient, and we can go into that as well. So I see a lot of people paying a lot of money for collagen without really looking at well, what's this really going to do for me besides spending a lot of money? Understood. I mean, and then would you say, you know, do we look for fruits in, that are high in vitamin C, use that to our advantage, hoping that it couples with, you know, the other amino acids? Well, the problem with fruit, as you know, one of my favorite sayings is give fruit the boot. Um, fruit, fruit has been hybridized for sugar content. And, um, what used to be a fairly healthy form of vitamin C and polyphenols has now just really become these fructose bombs. And um, there's no easy way around it. Uh, but vitamin C, you know, and I know, and hopefully most people know that we're one of the few animals that don't manufacture our own vitamin C. Uh, us new world monkeys and guinea, guinea pigs. And actually, it's a fascinating story. There's actually five genes that manufacture enzymes that take glucose and convert it into vitamin C. Vitamin C is a product of glucose. And we have four of those genes. And the fifth gene is turned off. It's a what's called a ghost gene. And you go, well, why did we turn that gene off? The, th the theory is we had so much vitamin C in our diet in the jungle that we didn't need to waste glucose to make vitamin C. Uh, we could use glucose to survive. And so if you had, we're very efficient creatures. So what the heck, let's just turn that off. Why is that so important? Well, we know when animals are under stress that they their vitamin C manufacture goes through the roof. Um, Linus Pauling was the vitamin C doctor because of that observation. But what's interesting is um, because we don't manufacture it, yes, we can swallow it, but vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. And we get rid of it in really about four hours. There's not much left anymore. Uh, Bill Sardi, who used to be the owner of Longevinex, uh, and I were good friends before he died of COVID last year. Uh, Bill Sardi was fascinated with vitamin C. And he did some really cool experiments with mice. You can genetically engineer mice to carry the human vitamin G, vitamin C sequence with a ghost gene. And those mice who carry the human ghost gene uh, live only half as long as mice who can manufacture vitamin C. Now, what's really cool is you take those mice who only live half as long and put vitamin C in their drinking water, and they will live exactly as long as a normal mouse, which um, is good news. Now, Bill Sardi was 
want to say that if we extrapolated that data to humans, then a human being would potentially live 250 years just by having a continuous supply of vitamin C. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. So I personally take time to release vitamin C twice a day. Uh, Bill Sardi said, hey, just carry around some 500 milligram vitamin Cs in your pocket and four times a day munch on one uh, and, and that'll do you just fine. I've written about uh, smokers and vitamin C and heart disease uh, extensively. I'm again old enough to have operated on most people with coronary artery disease early on uh, were smokers. And it was wonderful for us uh, for many reasons. Number one, they were skinny. Uh, number two, their blockages were in the top part of their blood vessels where they flexed. And once past those blockages, their blood vessels were gorgeous. I mean, perfect, pristine. And so once you jump past there, you had this gorgeous blood vessel to sew to. They were skinny and man, we just, it was great. Now, most of the people we operate on are insulin resistant, pre-diabetic diabetics, and their entire blood vessels are just crud. So why did, why did this happen to smokers? Well, smokers uh, get a lot of oxidative stress from tobacco smoke. And vitamin C is used up in quelling oxidative stress. Now, what's interesting is where blood vessels flex, and you guys know this, collagen is the rebar that kind of holds our blood vessels together and holds our skin together. That's why we get wrinkles. And that's why smokers get a lot more wrinkles than anybody else. So as collagen flexes, you get these breaks in collagen, and it literally sticks out into our blood vessels. If you got vitamin C, you rebuild those bonds, and it all quiets down. If you don't have vitamin C, the collagen sticks out, and then we put spackling compounds, cholesterol, to cover it up. And that actually explains why smokers had these discrete lesions where the bends were. And they didn't have any lesions elsewhere. Interesting. So long-winded is we got to have vitamin C. Vitamin and C is essential. I, yeah. So obviously, if we give fruit the boot, we're not looking at getting vitamin C from our, you know, that portion of the diet. Um, but we can get from other sources. We, are there any other foods that you would recommend? Turns out that olive oil and the polyphenols in olive oil, uh, hydroxytyrosol, has shown to boost you know, vitamin C production, double vitamin C levels in humans. And I think it's intriguing that um, the Mediterranean diet is you know, loaded with uh, olive oil and hydroxytyrosol. And it may be one of the factors that makes the Mediterranean diet so intriguing as a long-term diet. I'm curious about something. You spoke about uh, these age spots earlier and and you've reversed them over the past 25 years. And I know the listeners for our podcast are always very into, you know, cosmetic procedures and their appearance. And, and obviously we have a lot of lasers that remove these spots, but um, what foods do you recommend? What are, let's, let's just say two of the best secret weapons to a healthy skin. Obviously, you don't have to say two. You can make it more. But I'd love to take you know hear your take on this. Well, again, there's lots of ways to measure aging, but advanced glycation end product can be measured. And we can do that with a test that most doctors get routinely, which is hemoglobin A1C. And, uh, you know, every commercial now, uh, oh, I got my A1C down. Well, that looks at advanced glycation end products that are bonded to the hemoglobin molecule in red blood cells. And red blood cells last uh, about two months in circulation until we grind them up and reuse them. 
So hemoglobin A1C is actually a pretty good way of following how you're making advanced glycation end products. And it's actually pretty easy to do because most doctors are going to measure it. Um, and so, again, there's really two factors that, that influence this. The amount of sugars and or things that rapidly turn into sugar, certain starches, and the amount of protein that we eat. You got to have those two factors. Now, Walter Longo from USC and I are kind of the sole proponents of a fairly low animal protein diet to take that protein factor out of that picture. And the evidence is actually pretty strong, both his and mine. The other way that you can also measure how this is going on is insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, which we measure in our clinic every three months. So as far as we can tell so far, the best way to look at whether you're activating mTOR or not, and we can go down that rabbit hole if you want, but the, be the best way of deciding whether mTOR is activated or not is insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. Why would we be interested in that? If you look at super old people, and I have a lot of them in my practice in Palm Springs, uh, God's waiting room, um, that you uh, super old people, late 90s, early 100s, who are really thriving, run very low insulin-like growth factors, um, just to give you a number, 50 to 70. And there's three factors that have been shown to influence this number. Uh, number one is the amount of sugars or things that turn into sugar that we eat. The less of that we eat, the lower insulin-like growth factor goes. Number two, animal protein. And it could be a fish, it could be a chicken, it could be an egg. The more animal protein you eat, the higher insulin-like growth factor goes. The less you eat, the lower it goes. But to me, the, the exciting study came out a couple of years ago with Italian athletes. Uh, they were cyclists, and they took these cyclists, they put them on a training table. They all had to eat the exact same food for three months. One group ate their meals in a 12-hour eating window. Now, by that, I mean they ate breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. They had lunch at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. They had to finish dinner at 8 o'clock at night, 12 hours of eating. The other group, exact same food ate in a seven hour eating window. They had break fast at one o'clock in the afternoon. They had lunch at four o'clock in the afternoon and they had to finish dinner at eight o'clock. Then they had to eat the exact same food. What's fascinating is only the seven hour eating window guys lost weight. The other guys didn't lose any weight. But the insulin like growth factor of the seven hour eating windows plummeted. The other guys, it didn't change a bit even though they were eating the same thing. And I've seen this in my clinic. If you, you know, a lot of people, hey, I still want to eat protein. Thank you very much. And hey, I still want to have carbohydrates. Thank you very much. But I'm willing to eat that in a compressed window and let's see what happens. And sure enough, when they do that, it's a powerful way of dropping insulin-like growth factor. So there's all sorts of ways to skin a cat. Sure. So intermittent fasting, you know, it's the, I've been all the rave. And, and, you know, I think some of the top trends, obviously, even for beauty, uh, you know, have been intermittent fasting, cold plunge pools, um, you know, and, and supplementation. I think that may bring us into the next kind of category, you know, supplements is a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, and some of them go completely unchecked. You know, Paul Saldino, he said, heart and soil, you eat, you know, your freeze-dried uh, beef and liver organs, uh, or beef, liver and kidney. Um, 
we've got uh, David Sinclair saying, hey, you know, take down some NAD. We want to activate your twins, you know, resveratrol, all these different things, and even metformin. Um, what kind of supplementation should we be looking at here? I mean, it used to be that a multivitamin was something that everybody had to take, and then there was the the silver multivitamin for those who are older. And, you know, it, I think there's no justification as to why, you know, certain individuals, maybe not no, but there's very little uh, justification why older individuals need to take certain things versus others. I think we, we made these random numbers. I mean, if they're, and so uh, what type of supplementations, supplementation do you recommend for our listeners? And if you were going to like really simplify it, because again, some people need more of, of others, but if, if you were going to have a young, young, let's say 50 something year old patient that said, I want to take three supplements. What are the most important ones? Vitamin D has got to be at the top, right? Yep. You know, vitamin D has got to be at the top. Um, we are so vitamin D deficient. It's uh, scary. And for years we were trained that, uh, Vitamin D was toxic if you got above oh, 80 nanograms per milliliter. Um, that's not true. Uh, the University of California, San Diego, which has a very large vitamin D research group, thinks the average American should be taking 9,600 international units of vitamin D3 a day. Uh, that's 10,000 international units. They've never seen vitamin D toxicity at 40,000 international units a day. I've never seen vitamin D toxicity at 50,000 international units a day in some of my patients. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's critically important for the functioning of our microbiome. Uh, I've written and uh, the new book goes into further detail. It's critically important to activate stem cells in the lining of our gut wall. And as our gut wall deteriorates, so do we. And so keeping that gut wall intact and healthy should be actually our big job. And as you guys know, our inside of our gut wall is our skin turned inside out or the other way around. Uh, and so what happens on the inside of the gut wall is reflected on our skin. And so, yeah, vitamin D is everybody should be taking vitamin D3. And you take, you take, go ahead up there. Oh, no, I was just going to say, it would, would you recommend a hybrid of the D3K2 or just? The yeah, no, I like K2 a lot. Um, you don't need much K2 and people obsess over whether it should be MK4 or MK7. Uh, my particular K2 has both, but just take a hundred micrograms or so of, of K2 and you know, don't worry about it. And what, what dose of vitamin D are you taking? First well, so I take 10,000 international units a day. Um, and that's what I really have most of my patients on. And again, we measure vitamin D uh, every three months. And so we'll know exactly where anybody is on the scale. And we have people, a huge amount of my practice is autoimmune disease now. And some of these people uh, have such leaky gut. I, first of all, I've never seen an autoimmune patient who has a normal vitamin D, period. I've never seen a patient with leaky gut who has a normal vitamin D. And so you got to repair the gut wall and vitamin D is a great way to start. Awesome. Love it. And then, and then what I, what I asked earlier is what are a couple more supplements that you think are really necessary? Cause I know everyone says vitamin D and I take that every day as well, but I don't really take a ton of other supplements. Um, I know Dr. Lakey does. Um, and I'm just wondering what you would recommend to people that are listening. Well, you know, when I met Big Ed, the guy who changed my life over 25 years ago, I thought supplements made expensive urine. Um, <laughs> I really did. And even though I was using supplements to keep hearts alive for heart transplantation, sitting in a bucket of ice water for 48 hours, and I was using them to protect the heart during heart surgery, and it really never occurred to me to swallow these things. Um, and 
when we measure the effects of supplements, particularly polyphenols, on people's flexibility in blood vessels, on people's stickiness on the inside of their blood vessels, we can see, and I've published this data, of people who we put on some simple, but just giving it one example, grapeseed extract. And we can see that their blood vessels become more flexible and they're not, the blood vessels are not sticky. And then a lot of people, when they get a good result, go, oh, good. Uh, all right, that's fixed. I don't have to take that anymore. And they stop it. And then we see them the next three months and, you know, it's things are back being sticky and they're not flexible. And we go, what the heck? You know, what happened? And they said, oh, well, I was fine. So I didn't need that anymore. And then we go, um, would you start taking that again, please? And let's see what happens. Yeah, just yesterday, um, saw a patient from Vancouver who decided, yeah, uh, I don't like taking supplements anymore. And I'm just going to stop them. And, you know, I'm looking at his blood work. I'm going, what the heck? Uh, what happened? Because his homocysteine went through the roof, his C-reactive protein went through the roof, uh, his vitamin D plummeted, his B12 plummeted, his folate plummeted. And he said, what the heck? And he said, oh, uh, I don't like supplements. Uh, they don't do anything. Well, I said, you see all these red marks? Um, you see your previous tests? These were green. And he said, that was the supplements? And I said, yeah, hey, listen, I thought they made expensive urine. Uh, they are not making expensive urine in you. Get back on them, please. <laughs> Love how that works. So grape sheet extract for sure, guys. Listen up. It'll make a lining of your, your blood vessels not as sticky. Yeah. Uh, and again, time release vitamin C. It's, it's really easy to do. I mean, we if we just, been, you guys, you know, skin doctors, Vitamin C is the way we, you know, protect our collagen and get rid of our wrinkles. And why not? Definitely. Yeah, we're, we're big. Oh, wait a minute. You guys don't want to do that because, you know, you'd be out of business. You, know? <laughs> you could just add the time release vitamin C with the Botox and it acts even better. Yeah, it makes our results look better. So we definitely are proponents. There's no doubt. Um, when we talk about the the future of aging, I mean, listen, there are so many different studies. There's so many different things in the works. And obviously, I think that regenerative medicine, uh, DNA manipulation, all these things are going to play a role at some point. You know, they're closer than you think. And where do you see longevity uh, in the future? You know, what does the future of aging look like? And especially... You know, I'm imagining that it'll be tied to our intake. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, it's more than that. And, and the, the new book is is really Hippocrates 2,500 years ago, you know, the father of medicine, said all disease begins in the gut. And uh, the guy was right. I'm, I'm still, I spent 25 years trying to figure out why he was right. And I'm getting closer every year. Another way of paraphrasing that is death begins in the gut. And we now know that if you look at these super old people who are 109 and thriving, and you look at their microbiome, uh, their microbiome, number one, is very diverse. It has the diversity of a healthy 30-year-old. Most older people's microbiome is disasters. And they have certain cornerstone, keystone species that um, more and more appear to be critical. What's even more interesting is that I write about in the new book is these people, their gut microbiome has evolved to handle xenobiotics. Now, xenobiotics are all these plastics and forever chemicals. And believe it or not, the microbiome is really good at eating things. Um, I mean, we now have a microbiome that can eat oil slicks. They, they just like carbon atoms. And so what's really cool about this new study is these guys, these super agers, 
they've got a microbiome that is is ready for anything that we can throw at it. And my personal feeling is you know, longevity medicine should be focused on the wall of our gut and our microbiome. And with each passing year, the Human Microbiome Project finished in 2017. And with each passing year, we're getting more and more you know, exciting news about these individual bacterial species that seem to have an incredible effect on our brains, on our moods, on the wall of our gut. And certainly in experimental animal data, death begins uh, as the wall of the gut begins to fail, begins to fall apart. And as long as that wall is intact, you know, go for it. You're not going to die. So, you know, I mean, what what's a heart surgeon doing interested in the gut? I mean, what a joke. Um, I mean, what's what's David Permit or a, a neuro, you know, neurologist interested in the gut? Well, we joke around and say, geez, you know, we're all coming down and visiting what Hippocrates talked about. It, it, it is interesting how medicine is is now focusing in that area because, uh, you know, I even just listened to one of the studies on um, where they had done truncal vagotomies where you, you cut the vagus yep. those individuals. You know, what happens with feeding someone, you know, chemicals and it never reaches the brain? It, it, was, it was very interesting to me. So I think, you know, you're right. The gut's going to be the center of... of what happens? We originally thought it was the brain. Now it's right. It's it's moved to the other, a completely different area. Any, um, you know, what about biohacking hacks? You know, what does that mean when people are talking about, um, you know, biohacking? What, yeah, what's what's your take on that? Considering we talked about supplements, which is a little different. Um, biohacking is a little, quote unquote, more serious. Um, what are your takes on it? Well, one of the things I like to remind my patients is that these super, super old people, um, number one, they're not on bioidentical hormones. Um, sorry, they're not. Um, they're, they're not sitting in tubs of cold ice water. Um, <laughs> they're, but, you know, I, I grew up in the upper Midwest and cold exposure uh, certainly resonated. There are a lot of, you know, really old, healthy people in the Midwest. And I'm, I have nothing against cold exposure. I think the other thing, having lived in Palm Springs for a number of years, is that heat exposure, um, saunas, um, <laughs> living in Palm Springs in the summer, uh, or Florida in the summer, there's something, you know, Arizona in the summer, there is clearly something there. And we we can measure what that something is. And that's what I wrote the last two books about, and that's mitochondrial and coupling. And so all so many of these hacks really are because of mitochondrial and coupling. And that that's too crazy a thing to talk about today, but um, well, if you look at to generalize, I mean, I think it's more of putting your body under stress. I mean, it's extreme temperatures. You know, I'm a Midwestern boy too. I'm a Wisconsin boy, but, uh, oh, you know, yes, I definitely know. And I think and he lived in Chicago for a long time. So we definitely know the, the winters. Um, but I think, you know, it's probably those extremes that are doing something and, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, sorry to interrupt. It was, no, that's true. You know, the, these sort of extremes and I've had them off on my podcast. And so these, you know, these extreme, they're, they're activating heat shock proteins. And I wrote a lot about that in my career as a heart surgeon, you activate heat shock proteins and it sets up protective mechanisms to protect mitochondria. And these, mechanisms are actually mitochondrial and coupling. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've got a PBS special out right now called Just One Thing. And that just one thing uh, is mitochondrial and coupling. And the example I like to use is there's a there's a there's several theories of aging 
And one of the theories of aging is uh, kind of, oh, the wear and tear or the the, the work of aging is it's just, it'll eventually wear you down. And one of that theories is, okay, the smaller the animal, the higher its metabolic rate and the shorter its lifespan. The bigger the animal, the slower the metabolic rate, the longer its lifespan. And that pretty much is true. The exception of that is birds. Uh, birds are very tiny, but birds actually have incredibly long lifespan. A parrot can live 80 to 100 years. Um, hummingbirds in captivity uh, can live uh, 12 years, like our dogs. And yet, you know, a hummingbird's heart rate is like 1,100, 1,200 beats a minute. You know, and how the heck do they live this long? Um, and I joke, I love the joke. Um, when I was at Loma Linda, I wanted to get a cockatoo and there was a bird lady uh, in the town next door who sell birds. So I go in, I was about 40 years old and I said, Hey, you know, I, I want a cockatoo. I used to have love birds in college. And she said, yeah, okay. Uh, you're a bird person. Uh, all right. I'll sell you a cockatoo. Um, who's going to take care of the cockatoo after you die? And I go, uh, uh, <laughs> and, and she said, well, this bird is going to outlive you. And I go, huh? And well, she said, yeah, you know, you're 40 years old. You know, maybe yeah. you'll make it to 80. And this bird, you know, is going to need somebody after you. And I want to know who you're appointing to take wow. care of this bird. Wow. And I'm going, you are crazy, lady. <laughs> <laughs> It, it turns out she went crazy at all. And so how does this cockatoo live so long? Well, birds have the most uncoupled mitochondria of, of any organism. And that's how they beat aging. And uh, long story short, uncoupling mitochondria makes these energy producing power plants not work as hard. They literally kind of blow, blow off steam uh, like a pressure cooker. And the mechanisms to do that is what I write my books about. And it just so happens that polyphenols are a great way of uncoupling mitochondria. So I'm having some green tea and coffee is a great way of uncoupling mitochondria. And so let's, you know, we'll just sit around. You can bring your coffee cup back on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So anyhow, but that's how birds do it. They uncouple their mitochondria. So, so cool. before we sign off with you, I have a question for you. Um, just out of curiosity, what is your um, schedule for today when it comes to breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And what do you eat for all our listeners? Because I think they're fascinated with your knowledge, all of your books, all of your experience. Um, so we feel like, yeah, let's just do as you do, um, get you to, to, you know, get everyone to where you are. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've written about this for, uh, for a lot. Uh, so during the winter, and that I define as from January 1st to June 1st, uh, I only eat one meal a day. Um, so I didn't have any breakfast. I won't have any lunch. I'll eat all my calories between five and seven o'clock tonight. And I've been doing that now uh, for, I think this is my 24th year of doing that. And interestingly enough, why do I do it? Um, well, and actually, as far as I know, no one's corrected me yet. I'm the first person to write about intermittent fasting in my first book back in 2006. And it's a Funny subject, if we have the time. Uh, my first book was Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, and it was done by Random House. And mm -hmm. my, I had an entire chapter on time-restricted eating. And uh, my editor said, this is nuts. This is crazy. <laughs> Your book is crazy enough, but I'm not going to let you do this because, you know, you're a whack job. Yeah. I said, look, I'm telling you, you know, the research is powerful. It's, you know, it's well documented. And I've been doing it myself for several years. And we went back and forth. She said, all right, I'll give you two pages to make your case. And 
if anybody picks up the book, they'll find the two pages. <laughs> so I was talking at the big conference in Arizona a couple of years ago, and who would be in the audience? And then my editor, Heather Jackson, and she walks up to me. She said, I got to apologize. You were so right. I should have listened to you. Uh-huh. You're so right about, you know, intermittent fasting. And I should. Could I give you the chapter back? I said, nah, it's all right. But she said, I should have known you were right. Wow. Pioneered it. That's great. So, and so what did I have last night? Well, I had uh, a handful of pistachios. I had a glass of uh, Pinot Noir red wine. And then um, we actually uh, cooked a some pastured uh, chicken thighs with um, sage, oregano, and rosemary in olive oil and some white wine. And that's what we had for dinner. Oh, and uh, artichoke hearts. So that was dinner. Wow, that sounds amazing. Uh, and and throughout, and, and, and you do dr- and drink coffee and tea. Um, yeah, so I drink, I drink about four, four cups of tea a day. I drink about three cups of coffee in the morning black. Me too. My, my tea has all sorts of weird stuff in it, uh, mint and well, I, 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 just crazy. Um, uh-huh. So there's, a, there's an interesting study recently published out of um, Italy called the, the Green Med Diet. And the Green Med Diet is a Mediterranean diet with the addition in these volunteers of three cups of green tea, uh, four cups of green tea a day, with the addition of a funny algae that's called duckweed. And duckweed is just an algae. And so these people had to have some duckweed. And they showed that compared to a Mediterranean diet, which is pretty doggone good, uh, the green med diet actually had improved markers of vessel health compared to a Mediterranean diet, improved markers of heart health. And it turns out it's pretty much the diet that I give my patients. So, And yeah. I know a lot of people do these, these so-called, you know, diets or, and then they say they have a cheat day or a cheat meal. Do you believe in that? Or do you just believe in keeping your regimented course throughout um do you ever cheat for example you know if you're in italy with a nice pesto pasta or something like that yeah so uh, one of the things we've noticed is um glyphosate roundup is in everything that we eat here in the united states it's pretty much banned in europe and we'll have a ton of my patients who have an autoimmune disease or multiple autoimmune diseases, and they go into remission and they go to France or Italy and they have the pasta or they have the bread and they don't react. And they, to a person, they go, ah, you know, Dr. Gundry's cured me. I can have these things again. And they come back to the United States and they have our pizza or our bread And within a week, they're on the phone going, oh, my gosh, you know, my psoriasis is back. Or, oh, my gosh, you know, I've got diarrhea and, you know, blood in my stool. What the heck? They said, well, you weren't cured. You ate things that didn't have glyphosate in them. And glyphosate is a really great way to actually cause leaky gut, to kill all your gut microbiome off and yeah, and I find that to be true with me in Italy. I'm I'm pretty safe over there. Um, but if I try to do it over here, sorry. So no, so no cheating in the States, just out of the States. No, I, yeah, really, <laughs> don't do it here. It's not worth it. Um, I've got a patient in, in uh, Santa Barbara who there's a pizza place that ferments their dough. Sounds like a great idea. And... One of my patients who's got bad arthritis and who we'd been doing well with says, wow, you know, now I can have my pizza. And she goes and that night, you know, she's all achy. And she said, what the heck? And I said, that's because they're using our flour and our flour is full of glyphosate and fermentation isn't going to fix that. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I've heard exactly that from people, from our own patients that say, you know, I have these food type of sensitivities or intolerance in the States. I go abroad and I can eat everything, even cheese, and I'm, and I'm lactose, you know, intolerant. But it only in the States. The lactose is fine for me in other places, which is interesting because it doesn't make sense. But as you say, it does. So, well, and it's casein A2 milk over in France and Italy, and it's casein A1 milk here in the United States. So, and there's plenty of lactose in the gelato in France and Italy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the casein that they're reacting to. 